to the room. Yep, that's the idea. Okay. Oh, Steve, this, is, this is the secret message. <laughs> I don't know. Tell me. Need one? No. <laughs> yes, yeah. It seems like it went past. All right, we're on. We're on. Good. We'll call the Health and Human Services Committee meeting of uh, September, uh, August 20th, 2019, to order. Uh, roll call, please. Um, here. Roger Imdick here. George Corky Berg. Steve Amon and Harlan Madsen and uh, uh, Raleigh are absent uh, today, so if you're to be presiding over the meeting, thank you for your patience with this uh, awkward task. <laughs> Welcome, everybody. Uh, we're, uh, we're embarking on a new adventure, looking at all the agenda items we have in front of us last night. Great late night reading. Um, first thing we have to do is approve the, the minutes of the last meeting of August 5th. Somebody please move. Uh, oh, so the, move. We have a second. I'll second that. All in favor, say aye. Aye. Proof. Same. Uh, opposed. Same sign. Motion carried. Uh, bills. Allowance of bills. Move on the bills, Mr. Chair. We have a motion. We have a second. I'll second it. We have a second. All in favor, say aye. Aye. Opposed. Same sign. Motion carries. Cancellation of warrants. I will move on the uh, warrants, Mr. Chair. I'll second that. Any discussion? All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Now to the fun part, 905 Development Impact LLC contract with Reflective Counseling Services. Sherry, you're going to be making a presentation. Mm -hmm. Good morning. Good morning, Good morning. So I bring before you today for your approval a contract between Candioy County Health and Human Services and Developmental Impact LLC. Um, the contract is to provide reflective supervision services to public health and child protection supervisors. Reflection super reflective supervision is designed to provide support to providers who work or supervise with families who have difficult needs and situations. The service will be provided monthly to each group. The contract dates are August 1st, 2019 through June 30th, 2020. The contract amount is $10,340 and it's fully funded through a grant with the Minnesota Department of Health. So I ask for a motion to approve the contract. So moved, Mr. Chair. I'll second. I have a second. I have a question. Um, development impact, I was trying to uh, look them up online. I, I um, it's uh, so the provider is Tracy Schreifels and she um, it, it's a private um, company that she has and she is currently providing reflective supervision to um, uh, some of our public health organizations and also to supporting hands. So we're familiar with her work. All right, and she's from St. Cloud. In St. Cloud, yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, any further questions? A call for the motion. All in favor of approving the contract for $10,340, please say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign, motion carries. Thank you, Sherry. Uh, next on our agenda is the work number participation. Here in Deb. Good morning. I'm Deb Grunwald. I'm the supervisor at Candor County Health and Human Services in the financial area. And I'm here today to present a contract um, for the work number. That's our layman's language for, for what this is. It's a uh, it's a program that um, became DHS and, and Equifax came into a contract in 2014 where um, we can access employment information on people to help be more efficient in verifying last day worked, earned income, things like that for most of the major um, employers and even some of the employers that are not um, as big as like McDonald's and things like that. And so um, DHS is asking that we, um, with the uh, Minnesota Department of Human Services, they are participating with the uh, um, social service administrators, and um, they've been working with them to, um, as a participation agreement for, Kandere, for the counties in, in Minnesota to help cost share. And they did a little bit of uh, research, and what they have come up with is a, um, per number of hits or inquiries that we do with the work number. And so for Candy Eye County, um, the amount is $742 for the year. 
some of the bigger counties or some of the counties that use it more um, have a larger share. Um, Equifax or uh, the, the uh, contractor um, with the Department of Human Services is asking us to um, sign a participation agreement and so that's why I'm here today to have board approval to enter into that contract for the participation agreement. Any questions? Uh, I have a question. It's a small amount, mm -hmm. uh, but we have to go through this process for approval every time, correct? This is the first time, Mr. Chair. Um, yesterday we, we met as a group, and it, this, this is something new that DHS is requiring. So it's no. So, the, so for, they wanted some skin in the game from the county, so our share of the skin is $800. For the year? For the year. For the year. Thank you. They give us 600 free inquiries, and then anything over and above that, they've estimated by county, and so our share was $742 for the year. Got it. Thank you. Mr. Chair, if we didn't do that, it would cost us more than that, just making the calls on our own mm -hmm. to the businesses. Mm -hmm. And sometimes the, the larger businesses won't even give us information over the phone. They tell us to use the work number, so our hands are a little bit tied, and we have to lean on the clients to, to bring in their verifications, and, and sometimes that doesn't happen, and we're required to help as much as we can to verify information for the, our clients. Okay. You need a motion? Yep. Okay. I so move. I'll second that. We have a motion to second it on the participation agreement for $742. All in favor of the agreement say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carried. Thanks, right. Deb. Thank you. Thanks, Deb. How are we doing on time? We're doing great. Hi. Good morning. Good morning, morning. morning Tim. Tim. It's time again for MSSA legislative proposals. And those proposals today that I'm going to bring are going to be six. Four of them are repeats from last year, and two of them are new. So if it's okay with you, I'll review the two new ones and then ask for your approval of the four um, that have been brought over from the previous year. And I can ask, answer any questions you might have um, regarding any of the proposals that I brought forward today. Um, just a little bit overview what happens once you approve these proposals. If you choose to do that, then they go on to our regional MSSA conference, and the membership there review them. If they're approved, they move on to the state level MSSA membership um, annual meeting and if they're approved there then they become part of the MSSA legislative platform for the year. So that's kind of the process. Um, the very first proposal that I'm going to bring up today is a new one. It's called Min Choices 2.0 Efficiency for Lead Agency Reviews. This proposal actually came at the request of some of our staff. Um, as you know 2.0 Min Choices has now been delayed about two years. There was also numerous pieces of legislation that were added related to Min Choices this past legislative session. And one of those was to require that Min Choices, as an assessment, go from its current version to a conversational based assessment, which we're totally fine with. But the concern came as a result of three of our staff who actively participate in the rewrite committee and other assessors in other counties that when DHS was proposing the rewrite, they weren't going to include the lead agency review elements. And these are the criteria by which we are audited by the state that we have to pass. There are currently 36 elements that you have to can, um, include in assessment and care planning. And if they're not included, you're cited. And in the past, Min Choices met a lot of those criteria through a specific question or an area. When they moved to the conversational part, DHS says that the assessors or case managers would have to just remember manually them, add them into a written paragraph. And that is very difficult to remember 36 elements and to include them when you're talking to a person and you're and going over lots of factors that are important to that person. So this request is that not only would the conversational based assessment move forward with the health psychological components, it would also require DHS to include the lead agency audit compliance criteria. They could be a specific question or in our electronic tool there could be an electronic prompt to say this is the appropriate section to add the following in. Our assessors really believe that administratively, if we want to streamline the process and reduce time, that's how we need to build Min Choices 2.0. And now we have an opportunity with the delay for that to be included. So my proposal brings forward to add that aspect to the statute um, so that DHS includes that in the rewrite um, criteria or factors that they include. Any questions? Um, all the other counties in our district are uh, submitting sim this similar proposal then? 
No, I don't believe so. Um, we we are kind of unusual that we have three members attending that. We don't really have anyone else in the whole region that participates in the rewrite committee. We usually provide information to them, okay. um, and, but there are other counties, mostly from the metro area, that participate in the rewrite. Um, but this is a pretty standard concern amongst all of the mentors that attend our uh, mentor meeting. DHS has acknowledged your concern, but hasn't been willing to go so far as to say that they actually would work towards this. So by bringing this forward as a legislative proposal, we're hopeful that it brings it to the forefront um, and allows others in DHS to review and have this information as well so it comes into consideration. Great. That's, that's great. Uh, our, our county can be <laughs> uh, the lead in this. Yeah. We've got great staff that are participating, and this is really good input from them. Okay. Any, further, any questions? Further questions? Do you need a motion? A yep, motion please. For each one separately then? Um, I think we could do the two new ones separately and the four that are from previous years as one motion, if that works okay. for you. Okay. We have, we have a call for motion, please. Uh, I'll move on the two new proposals. Or would one you, would you, oh, one at a time? Yeah, okay, point. thank you. I'll move on. Uh, I don't care. The first one you present. And I'll, I'll second this one. Any further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carried. Good one. On to the next. Sure. The other new proposal this year is something that starting January 1st, we as a county became responsible to do Min Choices assessments for PCA reassessments. Prior to that, Blue Cross Blue Shield had to complete those assessments. So we have inherited a large number of reassessments. What we realized as we started doing those is that when DHS created Min Choices, they didn't combine any rules, statutes, merge program criteria. They left everything as is. What has happened is we have referrals that are coming in for waiver reassessments, and we have referrals coming in for PCA reassessments. But they're like two different worlds. And for our intake staff, it has really added a lot of administrative layers. Waivers come in 90 days prior to the end of their service agreement. PCAs come in 60 days. They come in at different forms. We get information for the waivers, but we don't for PCA. And DHS is always interested in wanting to know ideas to improve efficiencies. And this is definitely one of those areas where efficiencies could be really achieved very easily. So this proposal requests that there's some standardization in the referral process for reassessments for min choices, no matter what program they're on. That they would all come in 90 days in advance when they need to be done to continue services. They would be done in the same standard form. And the PCA agencies, because there's no case management for personal care attendance services, they would provide the core information case managers are giving to assessors. Because right now, the assessors have to go out and make a separate request for it if they want it. Often, that information may or may not be in the home when they go out to do the assessment. So this standardization would help with the intake, as well as it would help our assessors more efficiently complete those assessments timely. I have a question as far as has there been a problem as far as us finishing your staff finishing on time currently? Um, you know, well, we are currently right now in a, a stage of where we've had more volume of assessments than we've ever had historically. Um, so up until the month of August, I would say we have made it right on time. I may have to bring back a little different report to you as we go into the fall. Um, we have been receiving um, intakes at a volume in a day equal to what we used to get in a month. Um, hopefully, it's just a one-time occasion, meaning sometimes that happens depending upon the year or when people need services. Um, so we're hoping it equalizes out. But um, at this point, we have been on time. But this will help us be more efficient and be able to do more volume because we will increase volume. That is, a, that is statistically likely we'll have more and more assessments every year to do. Okay. Mm -hmm. And currently, how many per personal control attendants do we have? Uh, we have 10 FTEs that are assessors. We've had one individual now moving to a new area. So as of this coming month, we'll move down to nine FTEs. And then hopefully we'll go back up to 10 when our individual transfers into our unit. OK. And with the sur surge of uh, influx of more uh, applicants uh, come in, does that require? And we require more hiring? More hiring? I, I think if, if, we, if it continues, we'll have to have discussions. At this time, we're hoping once we're back fully staffed, mm -hmm. certainly going down to nine will be a challenge. But once we're fully staffed, we're hoping it'll be OK. But we'll have to address that if we see it's a consistent pattern. This time, it's been a kind of a one-time month. And then losing an FT at the same time makes it a little challenging. But uh, we would bring that back to you if we thought that was a need ongoing. All right. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Any questions for the question? Um, just a comment, I guess. Uh, increasing efficiency, and I was reading also, is cost neutral. 
can't go wrong. No. <laughs> uh, yes, it's definitely a benefit if we could get these some of these minor things accomplished um, by merging programs, make some similarities. Sure. I still move. Uh, we approve this. We have a motion. We have a second. I'll second. Second by Mr. Indek. All in favor. Uh, please signify by saying I, I do have a question. Oh, do you have sure. a question? Oh. Um, so these policy proposals, um, did those the two new ones, did they initiate in our department here, or do you have district meetings where you talk about similar issues? And Because I'm thinking as we get to fall policy here in three weeks or so, if every county has uh, their own policy uh, items, hard to sort through them all. So these did initiate here through working with my staff and ideas and suggestions that they have. It will now go to our regional MSSA group. Before where, we go to fall policy. And then if there is anything, because I'm on the state legislative um, MSSA council, I actually serve on the state level, we would merge those or combine them by talking to authors about ways in which to bring them together, or sometimes we do them separately if they're distinct enough. So that process does occur through innately through the MSSA legislative proposal piece before it gets to the state level. It's because sometimes different regions in the state bring in similar pieces, and we might talk to both of the authors of them, asking about them merging um, together, or if they're distinct enough, we keep them separate, even though there's an understanding that they go down a similar path. Mm -hmm. And I imagine um, the size of the county makes a difference too in the uh, number of cases that you you're going to end up doing it in this specific case so yes we 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 are a regional center and um every county is different um certainly there are counties that are doing significantly more pca assessments than we are but um we are one of the larger in this region yes i would agree with that by numbers thank you mm -hmm. um, appreciate you know the uh understanding what the challenges are and and you know Proposing it as a policy agenda item for the for the policy committee. Thank you. The uh, go ahead. Did we get a, approval? I can't remember. No. We haven't voted yet. Yeah, okay. We'll vote on it uh, first. I just want to comment. You know, mm -hmm. uh, a person that cares about their job uh, and doesn't care about their job. This this shows that the, the people and the staff you have working for and yourself show that you have a commitment to your job and you understand exactly the process. And you're taking action on something you see is not correct and needs to be corrected. I want to commend you on that. Well, thank you. We and your staff. we have very good very good veteran personnel in this area, and um, I really appreciate all of their input and their willingness to serve on some of these committees that help us bring forward and have the knowledge that we need to to make these proposals as well. That's a great extra commitment on their part. Great. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. I'll share that with them. You too. I'll call for the question. All in favor, say aye. 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 Oh, same sign motion carries. Thank okay. you again. Yeah. And then the last four are those which we brought prior. I believe everyone was here. Corky was in the audience on oh, that yes, time. Oh, yes, I was. <laughs> um, um, I'm not sure if you have any questions about those. One of them is Carol's, and basically that's to receive funds to support some of the recovery work they have. The other three are, um, again, related to Min Choices. I don't know if anybody has any questions on any of them or if you would like to take them as a group to move forward. Um, I don't know if there's another place on the agenda to uh, to discuss this, but has the recent move um, by DHS to approve healthcare providers other than Prime West, has that affected any of your discussions downstairs and, and what policies you might bring forth? Yeah. Not at this time. I'm not involved in any of the procurement pieces. So um, pretty much at my understanding right now, that's kind of at that level of individuals that are involved in that. Um, maybe Larry and Tammy Joe may have more information, but I don't have anything specific related to that. Okay. okay. Would you like to deal with this group all three at once? Sure. All Four? Yeah, I think that was her suggestion. Okay. Yeah, I would move on the, the four that presented earlier. All right, we have a motion, we have a second. Uh, since I wasn't, do you want to do it? I'll, I'll second the yeah. motion. Okay. All in favor, any further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, motion carries. Thank you. I'll uh, Thanks, look Tammy. forward to, I think this will be a good way for us to bring forward our information. So thank you. Thank you. Hi, Safe Avenues. Hi. Hi, Jen. How are you guys? You want to just do a good. brief introduction? So I was asked to come and give you guys an update. So I brought you guys our, it's hot off the press, our annual report. All right. Um, so I'm just going to pass this around. Jen, want to introduce yourself? 
Yes, sorry, I'm Jen. I'm the John, Jen Johnson. I'm the executive director of Safe Avenues. Um, and so we're here just to give an update on Safe Avenues. So Safe Avenues has a number of programs. Most of you guys are probably familiar with our domestic violence shelter um, that's here in town and also our parenting time center. Uh, but we also have a number of other programs. Um, we serve eight counties. And so this annual report kind of talks about a little bit about each program. And one of our more exciting and newer programs is our community um, education program that goes out into schools and teaches seventh and eighth graders what a healthy relationship is and maybe what it's not. Uh, it's a curriculum-based um, education that is 10 sessions. Each session is 50 minutes. Uh, and it's designed mainly for seventh and eighth graders. And the results of it are actually really impactful. They have a statistic of 92% <laughs> reduction in um, either abuse or perpetration. Or I'm sorry, um, yeah, perpetration or, why can't I think of the word? Victimization. Victimization. Thank you, Kristen. Um, and so, and that is consistent even four years after they've gone through the curriculum. And so we've initiated that in m multiple counties that we're in. So Renville County, Candy, Ohio County, um, Litchfield, uh, ACGC, we're even out in Hutchinson in that. And we are expanding that every year in the different um, schools that we're in. And so you can see on that second slide the number of hours that we have done in the last year specifically providing that education to students. So in the last year, we've um, educated over 1,600 kids on that curriculum alone, which is really impressive. So they do a poster when it's all done, and they we've used those posters to tell the story and of what they've learned. And it's really uh, interesting to see that they what they pick out of that. Um, they each make a poster of what they've learned and what they've thought about the stuff that we've taught them, not based on what we think they should write, but what they think they should write. And a lot of them talk about different elements of abuse, how to help their friends, how to manage their anger. Um, one of the most eye-opening statistics for us was that seventh and eighth graders literally thought that 80% 80, 80 of them thought that anger was something that could not be managed. And when they got done with this curriculum, they had the tools to be able to do that. So we were pretty, we're pretty proud of that program. Um, if you flip through this, you can see we have um, 32 active volunteers that help us out daily, weekly, monthly. Um, and then you can see that we have other counties, um, but we can flip to the Candy Ojai County stuff. So that's on page six. Um, if you look at the number of clients that we've helped um, in 2018, and then 2019 is only halfway through, so you can see there are uh, 496 domestic violence victims, 95 sexual assault victims, and 201 people that stayed in our shelter or our safe motel program. And that's just in the last year. Uh, the trend for shelter has been very consistent for the last couple of years that when we empty a room, we, we fill it within a matter of hours. Uh, they don't sit open long, um, and they're staying in shelter longer. So our average length of stay, when you average it out, is 23 days. But we typically will have people stay for a couple of months. Um, and that's not because um, they need to be in the shelter, but it's because there's not a transitional housing piece. There's nowhere for them to go. So they're, if there is housing, which a lot of them can't find housing, if there is housing available, they can't afford it. And, or it doesn't meet the criteria if they get housing assistance. Maybe they need a two bedroom or they need more rooms because of the number of children that they have. And so they're staying in the shelter longer. Um, and so I would say that our average typical client um, stays with us for about two months before they move on. Um, and so you can see that's reflected here in the numbers. When you look at the second slide on Candy, Ohio County, you can see that our staff handles 11 crisis calls a day. That's been fairly consistent for the last two years. Um, and with that 11 crisis calls, that's not calls for service uh, to coordinate services or to work with other partners. That's literally 11 people in crisis needing emergency shelter a day, um, which is quite high. So because we cover that, that eight county, that includes all eight of those counties, not just specific to Candy, Ohio County. Um, but that's still a lot. That's still a lot of people. You can see the breakdown in victimization type. Um, that's always interesting information. 
especially in my opinion, um, our Parenting Time Center um, deals with a lot of domestic violence families. Um, the Parenting Time Center specifically deals with both the perpetrator and the victim because they're keeping that child safe so they can see them. Um, and so you can see that a lot of the families that go through the programs that we have here in Candy, Ohio County are because of domestic violence. Um, we've also seen an increase, especially at the Parenting Time Center, in sexual assault cases where children are the victims of sexual assault. That actually was 4% of our cases this year at uh, the Visitation Center, which is not normal. That's a high number of kids. I mean, normally we maybe had one case a year, um, but this last year it was 4%, which, you know, maybe that's because of the Me Too movement. Maybe that's because more people are aware of sexual assault, um, but it's definitely impacting us from the county um, cases perspective, fam referrals from family services and that sort of thing. Um, and then the very next slide is on Harmony Visitation Center. And you can see um, by looking at this that we had uh, 281 children in our program last year. Um, they had just under 700 visits that they performed throughout the year. And when you look at uh, the numbers for the halfway through point of 2019, you can see that it's right on track to um, exceed the number from last year. So, and then the last couple of slides that um, are in here just talk about our agency as a whole. You can see that Safe Avenues invests quite a bit of money in our staff. We have 42 staff members. Uh, we invest just under uh, $15,000 on average a year in training and education for our staff, whether that's st training that we provide or whether it's training that we send them to. Um, our visitation center has been recognized as one of the top six visitation centers in the country, um, which is quite impressive. Uh -huh. At least we think so. <laughs> and uh, our, our staff for advocacy, um, we mentor other staff, we train other staff for other programs across the state, and we represent our region on a couple state boards. And so um, Safe Avenues should be proud of that. Um, you can see down here under the benefits, the different things that we provide for our, our employees and the costs to us as an agency. You can see that we provide um, PTO and sick time, which I think is pretty typical, but health insurance costs our employees only $30 a month. Um, which is nice, it's an 80-20 plan. You know, they're not the highest paid individuals, they're usually there because they are passionate about the work and they want to help people. Um, so we try to make up for our lower wages by offering different benefits. So that's what that slide is about. And then our very last slide just talks about our agency as a whole. Uh, one of my goals as the executive director of Safe Avenues for the last couple of years is to streamline the way that we operate and we have been able to do that by implementing different cost saving measures. So we joined a couple different federal food programs which enabled us to save anywhere between four and eight hundred dollars a month in the food that we provide to clients. And then we also had done an energy audit which enabled us to be more efficient with our utilities which saved us four hundred dollars a month. And we turn around and dump that money right back into our programs. So recently, some updates at the shelter specifically, I mean, our building is only 10 years old, but it sees a lot of use. We were uh, lucky enough to write a grant and get that funding to be able to replace all of our flooring, a bunch of our furniture, replaced air conditioners, um, added in security lights and that sort of thing. And we did that at our parenting time center as well. So we try hard to um, make sure that we're efficient with the funding that we have. And if you look at this, you can see that we typically sit um, for overhead for our agency, um, anywhere between nine and 11%, 13 at the highest if you add in fundraising, which is fairly low. So I don't know if you guys have any questions for me. I have more questions, but it, it would take too long. Um, <laughs> I'm gonna have to visit with someday. It, it, it just bothers me when I see the, the, the reflection of our community, the health, overall health, mental health uh, of our community, the children, but uh, I'm really surprised at the amount of uh, the family violence. I, it, it, has it, it's gone up from last year? I don't know that it's necessarily gone up. I would say it stays fairly stable. I mean, it's kind of cyclic. It depends on the cases and that that happened in the county. I think um, one of the things that it, the factors that have impacted shelter or domestic violence specifically is probably drug use. Um, and so, you know, at some point that's going to have to be be addressed. I know that maybe 
85% of the cases that we have at the visitation center specifically, um, the parents are there because of drug use and it has resulted in neglect to the children. And so that's why they're at the Parenting Time Center. And if they're not there for that reason, um, because family services is, isn't involved, they're there because of a protective order. So because there was abuse or hostility between those parents and they were court ordered to use a visitation center. But we have definitely seen an increase in um, drugs being an underlying factor. I wouldn't say that it is a, the sole cause of domestic violence because that's not the case, but drug use is definitely a factor. Is it uh, prescription drugs or illegal drugs or if it doesn't make it, it's a combination of all maybe? Yeah, I would, I mean, I don't have all of the information, so I don't know that I feel comfortable saying that, but I would say f off the top of my head is probably meth use. <laughs> I wish you had better news. I wish I'm sorry. Here, but, <laughs> I, I uh, guess the silver lining is that we are here and able to provide the help to the victims. Um, we, <laughs> one of the numbers in here, um, off the top of my head, I don't know the exact number, but I think it was 209, if I'm right, um, about the number of protective orders that we've helped victims with. So I guess the flip side of that is yes, this, these things are happening in our county, but they happen in every county and every state and across the country. But I think the important part is that people know how to reach people that can help them. So they come to Safe Avenues, they're able to call us, they know that we'll help them. We can go through court. I mean, one of the initiatives that makes Candy Ohio special is we have the um, Human Trafficking Task Force here. And so we're, we went three years ago from having eight trafficking victims that were identified to in the last quarter, so three months, identifying 26. So that doesn't mean that trafficking wasn't happening before. It just means that as a community, we're able to identify them better and be able to meet their needs. So I would look at it a little differently rather than you know that it's negative. I would say it's actually positive that we can help these people because we knew they were there. It's just a matter of reaching them. So, yeah. so um, the referrals that you get, um, I'm, I'm assuming that most of the churches and the medical facilities and the human service people and even law enforcement are fully aware of what you provide and can make that referral. And uh, when somebody calls, they don't know who to reach out to. Yeah. Um, so can you... What's the best way for someone who is in need to to reach out and find out about the services you provide? So we have lots of partners. Just on the Human Trafficking Task Force alone, there's 23 different entities that participate from schools to um, probation to law enforcement to the county attorney's office to uh, Rice Hospital. All of these entities matter in making those referrals. But I think that's something that's unique about Candy Ohio County, and we actually use it as a model. Uh, people ask us all the time, how do you get your law enforcement to participate on this? How do you get your, your county attorney's office to participate on this? And we always have this like blank look because we're like, what do you mean yours don't? <laughs> uh, so here in Candy, Ohio, we're actually very lucky and very fortunate that this community as a whole wants to do something and they do it together. And so we have very active relationships with law enforcement, the sheriff's department, the, the county attorney's office, the victim witness coordinators. And because of that, we are able to really move forward with lots of the different initiatives that are here. So this county is unique in that. I mean, I have seven other counties and they don't respond that way. <laughs> so I would say that one of the reasons why we have higher numbers is because people know that if law enforcement shows up, law enforcement's gonna refer them. If they show up at the county attorney's office, they're going to refer them. And so I think that that really matters and makes a difference. Same with the hospitals, same with the schools. So we, all of those connections matter. I think part of it too is that Safe Avenues tries very hard to have open houses. When we do training of our staff, which is pretty intense, we ask our different partners to come in and spend a morning talking about what their job is and how it intercedes with uh, advocacy so that our staff then have an idea of what they're doing as well and how we can partner together. And that's unique to this area. We've tried to start those initiatives in other places and it has not been as well received. So Candy Ohio County is, is unique and other places would love to replicate it. So, I mean, I think they should be proud. Is there a, I'm sorry. I was gonna say, um, I, I very much appreciate Safe Avenues. They make our job so much easier especially because um, it's, it's a way to kind of 
Um, we've had advocates come and help us with victim meetings. We've sat down with advocates. When they don't want to come to the courthouse, they've let us go to their building and meet with victims there. It's just been an amazing partnership to help us um, support victims kind of instead of just a, that's not my job, that's your job, uh, to come together and kind of do a 100, 360 support. Yeah. Is there a state association? For, for domestic violence? Yeah. There's two. So there's the Minnesota Coalition for Battered Women, um, fondly called MCBW, which is a state coalition. So any domestic violence program or shelter is generally a part of that. I actually sit on their state on their board at the state level. And then we have the um, Minnesota, so it's MinCASA, Minnesota Coalition Against Sexual Assault. Um, we never say their full name, we just call them by their acronyms. So it's MinCASA. They are the coalition across the state, just like MCBW is, for sexual assault. And we are part of those. We had a staff member that sat on that board as well. Um, and then there's the Minnesota Alliance on Crime, which is another state coalition for victim witness coordinators, and we are members of that as well. And that has more of a criminal justice focus. So more with court orders, um, protective orders, um, impact statements, that kind of stuff. And we, we are part of that as well. So we try to um, make sure that we are involved on multiple levels so that we get the information that we need to be effective and make changes as quickly as possible to be effective for clients that we serve. Thank you. Yeah. Rick, do you have any questions? Uh, no, I, I can make comments. I guess we got time too. I just think it's so fantastic that you're also including some preventive stuff that you're reaching out and educating the young kids, which goes along. And you're the experts who can really do that kind of training because you know all about that. And this service you provide is one of those services I'm thinking that the general community doesn't even know it exists until you need that service yep. and how do you get that and i think it's so important that you can come and talk to us about it and actually is going to probably you know get some media about this because the, the population needs to know that this is a we need safety nets for certain things and this is a very important safety net that we have and really appreciate what everything you're doing thank you thank you <laughs> i'll share that question with for you yeah. a, a two-phrase question to uh, our specific situation in our county, what is the target audience and how does that compare to the rest of the state? Are we unique? Are we not unique? Is there a certain group or any particular group uh, or situation other than you mentioned drugs that, that you can actually say is one of the number one uh, goal to, uh, to help resolve? Or, or not so target market as in like to prevent domestic violence right. or to stop domestic violence right to, to reduce the numbers you know i think that that's a hard question to answer because domestic violence happens to every race every ethnicity every gender um every social economic class you know from the poorest person to the richest person i think for somebody that would access services our services they're typically lower income, um, and I would say that that's not because higher income people don't need the help, but they have money to be able to access attorneys, where lower income, they don't. So they depend on legal aid, they depend on advocates to help them file orders and that sort of thing. But really there's, I mean, domestic violence happens to everyone, unfortunately. So it's not a matter of like, hey, if you went to church and learned how to treat somebody respectfully, you would suddenly not be a domestic abuser. I mean, like that's not, that's not a solution. I think the hard part about domestic violence is it really has to do with parenting education. And that's my personal opinion. I think it has to do with how you're raised because it's very cyclic. And you know the statistics say that if you're raised in a home with domestic violence, you're 75% more likely to either be a perpetrator or swing the other way and be a victim. And it's because you're raised in that environment, you think it's normal. So really, if you were looking at how do you stop domestic violence or sexual assault even, you really need to talk about prevention and it really needs to start early and so a thought to think about if you're talking about consent is how many people as an adult go, go up to little kids and say oh you're so cute i want to kiss you give grandma a hug right what are you telling that child by doing that you're telling them that they don't have a choice and they have to hug you or like when your child gets presents always everybody as a parent says oh go hug them they gave you a present it's not a it's not a choice 
right? So we're teaching them that their bodies aren't their own. And we do that subconsciously because that's the way we were all raised, right? So it's changing behaviors as simple as that uh, and letting kids know that their bodies are their own. And consent means something. It means, you know, you have the choice to choose. Um, but that's very different and it, it is very, um, depending on the culture that you're raised in, all of those factors impact that. And so what we're really talking about is social change and that takes a really long time. But a good place to start with that is primary prevention, getting into the schools and talking with kids about what to do. I mean, it was quite frightening for us to learn that most kids thought that anger was uncontrollable. How scary to think that at seventh and eighth grade level, they think that anger is uncontrollable. So, I mean, it's, I think a lot of it is having those conversations and teaching them a different way. So, but those are, those are my opinions. I, um, like I said, I can ask a lot of questions and yeah. I appreciate your knowledge and your information. Thank you for coming here for the report. Any further questions for our guests? Thank you, Jen. Yeah, thank, thank you. You, you guys much. have a good day. Thank you. Bye -bye. All right, moving along. Uh, administrative updates. Tammy Jo. I don't have any real updates. I don't know if anybody has any questions of me. Where everything's kind of moving along and everybody's busy and all of the departments and it's pretty much taking It's going to happen. It is. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Any further business to come before this meeting? Not all. Ask for motion to adjourn. I so move. Second. I'll second. We're adjourned. <laughs>